Hey, Kevin. It's Patrick. So they haven't logged in yet, or This is Patrick. Um, how are you doing? Hey, Patrick, thanks for yeah. Good to hear. Um, we do have. Just let you guys know, we do have uh, other like webinar attendees on the call. On the call, everybody else is muted, but um, there are folks popping on right now. So we've got. So wait, Mike's here. Um, and Martin from Eversource. And Kevin Worley from Eversource and Mark Rooney will be uh, joining us momentarily. So we're all on the same line under uh, this one account. Well, we we um, had a surprise surge in registrants, and we had a solution to expand capacity today, but um, that actually fell fell through. So um, thanks for calling in on the same line. We appreciate it. Um, what we're going to do is Chris Mason from Northampton and. Uh, Tom Gilden from West will be calling in as well, um, but I'm glad it's connected. Uh, let's try. Tom um, or Chris not on the call, are you? We just tried to unmute some people. Six. Uh, like it's connected. No, he's muted. Here. Oh, okay. Hey, Chris, uh, I think you just got a call. Maybe you, you mute yourself. Because the audio you're using your computer. Probably mute number seven and eight again. So let's find him. Make sure he's not muted. He hasn't flown yet. It's, um, it's funny that I don't see Kevin as a panelist. Oh, because right, he logged in with his, his email. That's okay. Though. 
would be funny is any list that we can make in the panel. Oh, let's do that. So it's Kevin? Yep. Okay, sorry. Nice. Uh, <laughs> looks like Chris and Tom have at least as the web portion, so hopefully they'll be on. Um, we should have a full house today, <clears throat> which is exciting. Um, have over 100 people registered, which is great. And I'm going to move through my piece uh, judiciously. Um, I think with our with our format, we're going to be running up right at the hour and then um, probably do time for questions after that. Uh, yeah, I'm probably not going to say too much more. I'm just going to try to get Tom and Chris uh, stuff. It looks like on now. Oh, I hear somebody and Tom. Tom, phone right. on. Hey Chris. Or, hey Tom. All right, now Chris. Okay. Uh, Chris. All right. So Chris, Chris has us on on C hold music. Um. All right. <laughs> uh. Great, Tom. Welcome. Thank you. What do, I, what do I do now? It says I got, I'm connected audio. Is it share file or something? What do I do? Do Is there any visual that comes on this? There will be in a minute. We're going to share our screen, and I've got um, the whole presentation. So I'll just move, okay, we'll, we'll move through it. Okay. Um, and, yeah, uh, what we'll probably do is while, while others are talking, if each of our panelists can, if you can mute yourselves. That would be great. Everybody else should be muted, I think, to start. Um, uh, all right. Let's unmute this. Why don't we unmute Chris? He said he try it again. Here you guys. Excellent. No, oh, great. Sorry, we didn't realize you were muted. Um, we can hear you now. Okay. Good. All right. Um, so I, I'll, I'll, I don't see um, the slideshow or anything, so I'm not sure. Not yet. I think we want to make sure we get great. all you guys up now. I think what we can do is um, can we mute everybody who's not a panelist? I'm here, Krishna. Uh, and I think Paul, Paul Carey, you're on as well. That's right. I, I muted it on my end, but, but I need to speak. So I, I just, uh, just want to apologize that we did have this um, technical glitch where some people who registered toward the end of the, the registration period, um, they can hop on. I just asked them not because they were the latest ones, and um, we'll, we'll record this and get it out uh, as soon as possible. Yep, everybody else should be muted. Um, they can't hear us right now. <laughs> so, uh, that's the yeah. um, All right. I think with that, uh, does anyone have any questions before we get going? We'll, we'll kind of control the slides from here, and um, you will say next slide, or we can. We'll try to. We'll try to anticipate when you're done with the slide, but we'll. Um, you can just direct us. Uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Somebody's got a little, this is Patrick, somebody's got a little background noise, uh, some people talking in the back. So just yourself, that would be great.
hear us? Are we muted? Uh, you can? I hear fine. I have you on my phone, though. I use the uh, computer doesn't have a microphone. So I go through the regular phone system. <laughs> yeah. What, what are you, Kevin, asking if you could hear you? No, that's we're in Pittsfield. Okay, yeah, if you, if you guys can mute yourself, that would be great, but, but welcome. Thank you. We can't mute our phone. We don't know how to mute our phone. Can't you mute us on your end? Uh, like we can. We'll go, we'll take a, uh, we'll take a crack at it. Thank you. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. This is Patrick Roach from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. We are going to get started. And um, everyone should be muted, but in the rare case that you're not, uh, please try to mute yourselves or limit background noise. Um, we will solicit most of the questions today over the chat feature, and we're going to run um, probably to a full hour, and then we'll do Q&A. We'll see if we can see that up. Um, and we're going to hear today from a couple communities, Northampton and Westwood, about their experiences doing the retrofit. We'll hear from the uh, utilities, Eversource, and National Grid about how to make sure you tap into their incentives. And we'll hear from us all about LED streetlights and the grant program with the Department of Energy Resources. So. Um, that's what's on our agenda today, and we'll try to cover some of the streetlight basics, you know, why LED streetlights make uh, sense as a retrofit option, what some of the considerations are for, um, for implementing them, what the process is to actually retrofit, um, and then the, uh, some of the cost and financing, how we're going to be involved providing technical assistance, and um, as I mentioned, incentives and um, so that will we'll dive in. Um, CPC, just as a background, we're one of the 13 regional planning agencies in the uh, we're for the Greater Boston region. Um, uh, and we were awarded um, the grant from to manage the state the, the grant for, uh, in this case. And our clean energy department, in which I sit, um, we focus on helping reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And in that work, we've helped over three communities uh, services uh, and products necessary to retrofit their lights, and that's added to about 70,000 street lights. So we've got um, some some good background in this, and we're excited to work with a whole host of new communities to help you through the process. <clears throat> One thing I'll note before we get into this is that there are some communities on the webinar who are from municipal light plants, and DOER does have the separate grant program for you. Um, um, in terms of the grant stuff I talk about, it's mostly going to be related to our grant, but um, a lot of the LED uh, stuff we talk about, I think, in the process should be, should be beneficial, as well as the case studies. Um, and the other thing I'll note is just for the municipalities who are served by National Grid, Sometime in the spring, National Grid will be coming out with a tariff that will to retrofit to LEDs without assuming ownership of the lights yourself. Um, we don't really have a lot of details on that yet, but we will plan to um, work with Grid to organize some sort of event to make that information known once it's available. So I think right now, um, as I'll talk about, this is program is really for the communities who own their lights. If you are interested in in, uh, in purchasing existing lights, then you would become eligible for this program. Um, and if you're a National Grid community, just want you to know that there might be a way for you to retrofit uh, without taking ownership. Uh, and tales of that will be will be coming later this this year. Uh, so 
with that, I'm going to dive in and talk about the grant from the Department of Energy Resources here, their uh, LED Streetlight Rapid Retrofit Program. So it covers Cobra Head Streetlights, so that's not the decorative streetlights, so the Cobra Head Streetlights, which are uh, pictured here, and the standard controls. Uh, so that would be a standard photo cell, and that it covers that at 30% of the material and installation costs. And that 30% is applied after utility incentives are subtracted from the for cost. Um, and there's just an image of the standard photo cell there that, that plugs in. And what's really encouraging is that advanced controls are also covered, uh, but this is at, uh, because of some of the advanced costs of this, uh, they're at 10% of the material costs for the advanced controls. And those uh, would do things like, um, would be controllers that instead of just react to whether there's sunlight or not, they could do motion sensing, they could also do dimming, um, and they could do, uh, they could have wireless capabilities so you could control and schedule them remotely and uh, that's where there's some really interesting capabilities, and we're going to hear uh, a little bit more about that at the end today and also from, from Westwood. So um, in terms of the technical assistance, the goal from DOER's perspective is we want to re retrofit uh, as many lights as, as possible and also leverage collective procurement to uh, get, get good pricing where we can. And uh, so MAPC is going to be providing collective procurement assistance for all elements of the of the process, so the audit, design, and project management, as well as product uh, procurement installation, and I'm going to go through each of those in more depth in terms of what those cover and how we're going to approach it. Uh, in terms of the requirements, I mentioned before, eligibility is that the municipality must own its existing lights. So um, right now, the way I think we're we're defining that is either you already own your lights, or um, you may have, if you have a purchase price from the utility and have appropriated funding for it, then we're going to consider that simple um, because some municipalities are um, who are about to purchase their lights are sort of waiting uh, because once they take ownership, they have to procure maintenance, a maintenance contract. And and if you're about to retrofit, if you really want to take ownership and then pretty quickly retrofit your lights, there can be that awkward period where you'd have to have a, a main contract in place before that happens. So we recognize some municipalities sort of holding off on that. So if you have a, a firm purchase price and you've appropriated the funding to make the purchase and all left essentially is to sign the paperwork and send the check in, we're going to call that um, as, as eligible. The requirements. Um, to receive the funding, if they have a third-party uh, expert complete streetlight audit, then that can be done within the past three years. Um, a little bit more about that later. The luminaires you install, the lights, need to be control-ready. So they don't have to have wireless controls, but they're control-ready, which means that the receptacle um, has a spot for seven pins. Uh, that, there's a photo there shown. The standard photo cell I showed the slide before only has three, and the extra four pins receptacles uh, would allow different data to be transferred. Um, and the fourth or the third requirement is that you'd work with MAPC on collective procurement of materials and installation. Uh, the big caveat is if you're coming into the program where you've, you know, you've already, you might have already done a procurement and you just have not signed a contract, that's fine. We're, we're not going to ask you to go back and do it again. Um, but if you if that's something that needs to be done, procuring the fixtures, procuring installation, we're going to ask that we do that collectively where possible. Uh, and I'll again I'll talk a little bit about that more later. And uh, in sort of to get into the program, what we're going to do is reserve funding. So we recognize that this process is going to take a while. Um, and in fact, the so what we're going to do is reserve funding up front to know how much is available to you. Um, and step one is we have an online interest, for, interest form that essentially confirms eligibility. I'll send out a link to that after the webinar. Uh, and then step two is, and so filling that, that form out essentially puts you in line, gets you, <clears throat> reserves your place in line. Step two is we're going to sign a memorandum of understanding with each community. Uh, we'll officially put down the amount of money we're reserving for you, 
based on um, what we know about your inventory, how much we expect it to cost, and essentially what we calculate that that percent um, to be. And we'll also put some there for um, the progress that uh, we want the community to make um, so we can sort of make sure that you're staying on track uh, for the schedule. The program ends at the end of, um, for, for our program, it ends at the end of 2018. So the, the completions need to um, happen by then. And I think that's it. So uh, the MOU, I know some of you have contacted me already. We uh, worked on with that um, with the OER on that, and we have uh, we have it ready to go. So I will um, we'll be able to get those signed uh, in very short order. So I'm just going to go into a little LED streetlight 101 here and talk about some of the um, some of the benefits. And first, to start off with is we know that uh, there's great energy savings to be had. Usually, see you know 50 to 70 percent energy savings when we retrofit, and it's possible to go go further. But um, some examples I'll show I show here is that a 50 watt high pressure system is probably a uh, region often gets replaced with a 19 uh, to 25 watt LED. And so right there, you can see we're at least at 50 percent. But the, um, the high-pressure sodiums use a little bit more energy than they're like nominally rated. Uh, so that 50 watt might use actually 55 watts, and that's that's what you get billed for. So um, right there, you can see that's where some of those 50 percent to 70 percent energy savings come from. As you move up uh, in the wattages, you tend to get great savings, and um, I'll get I'll explain why in a, in a minute. It, it deals with essentially how uh, the LEDs distribute light compared to the high pressure sodium. So LEDs are going to give you generally more even distribution. Up top, we have an image of a high pressure sodium light. And you can see it's got a big curved lens. It has a, it has a curved reflector inside that you can't see. And it uses a single bulb to try to light the whole area. And what often results in is overlighting the area directly beneath the light in an attempt to achieve you know, the right minimum light levels out towards the edge. Well, with LEDs, you can see here, there's two examples of them. Uh, the first one has uh, has all these individual diodes, and they're all positioned in a way to cover the area. So you basically uh, get a lot less uh, overlight. Um, you have these individual diodes. This is The bottom image is a, new, a newer type of um, uh, way to distribute the diodes, um, where they are, they're not actually facing straight down. They face sort of with the road and they get reflected down with some cut cut plastic or glass. Um, so you get some more even light distribution and that's a big place where the energy savings come from because you're not sort of wasting energy to overlight the area right underneath the light. Um, they also have got a much longer life and that translates to more maintenance costs. So uh, high pressure sodium bulbs tend to last five to eight years. The LEDs are rated right now to last for over 20 years, and the Cobra head models, um, common warranty out there for the for the Cobra heads is 10 years. So we've got a long life life expectancy um, for these, and you're going to have a lot less maintenance uh, to, in terms of replacements to do. LED is also going to have improved color rendering. So color rendering is essentially how well you can see colors under that light. And um, 100 would be the sun, full full spectrum visibility of colors. Um, high pressure sodiums are pretty low; uh, tend to have like 22 rendering index. The LEDs are at 75 or above, so you get better color rendering, which is um, can definitely be a factor important for safety. You know, you can see who's coming toward on a path or on the sidewalk. You can see the colors. That's important. Um, they have less light pollution and light less trespass because on that big curved lens, which actually can of the high sodium, which can actually reflect light back up into the atmosphere. The LEDs, as you see here, are, are uh, they call them full cutoff, so no light can escape directly into the atmosphere. Um, there is a little bit of an issue with blue light, which I'll talk about just briefly. Um, color temperature is something that is another consideration with LED. Sodium colored temperature is around what's called 2,000 Kelvin, and that has that sort of you know pretty warm, or almost orangey light color to it that a lot of us are familiar with. Some of the early LED retrofit 
targets were, um, over the last few years have been 4,000 Kelvin, and that is a pretty white light. Um, more uh, commonly, and we'll hear from Northampton today, 3,000 Kelvin is becoming common. Um, and at those higher color temperatures, like the 4,000s, you have a lot more blue light in the spectrum, and um, there are potential uh, issues with blue light around health. Um, and thankfully, though, 3,000 Kelvin options are now available, and um, uh, they're economic. They have a lot less blue light in them. And I know Chris is gonna, uh, from Northampton is going to talk about that a little bit more later. Um, this uh, just shows actually the spectrums of the of the light. We'll send this out. We'll send this out as well as the recording afterwards, so people can dive into the light issue a little bit more. Um, uh, generally, I caution that the sources of blue light that exist in our our life, um, like cell phones, TVs, and computer screens, tend to have much more of an impact on us than the street lights, given the amount of time we spend in front of them. Uh, but hopefully, because of the color temperature um, options we have with 3000K, as well as some other things, we have more options to control blue light than ever before. Uh, and the wireless controls, which we're incentivizing through this program, are one of those ways because we can actually, um, you can dim the lights or even turn them off, like at the hours of the night when they're not necessary, especially maybe in um, you know, really residential areas or something. In the program, we'd also encourage people to Think of whether you have stray lights that could be removed and eliminate that light pollution altogether. Uh, now I'm going to go into the retrofit process. Um, what? Where, <laughs> but um, we'll focus on the blue boxes. The typical process is going to start with a street light on it, and that's going to tell where all the street lights are, what all the information about them is. Uh, it's going to go. Then you're going to go into the design process, where you're really figuring out what are the right light levels that I want in my city or town in the different areas. What's what you need. Then, based on those levels, as well as other discussions about what qualities you want in the product, um, then move into product selection. And then once the product selected. Uh, it will perform the installation. And usually we see that we've got a project manager on board who is um, sort of managing the installer as well as performing quality assurance on their work, making sure what they said should get installed gets installed. And because you might have, uh, you know, it might be a few hundred lights or it might be a few thousand lights. That's a lot going on. And you make sure that um, nothing gets missed and that what you paid for gets, gets installed. Um, from the from the green boxes here, starting on the far left at the top, at the end of the process, we're going to reserve your funding through the DOBR grant. So that can happen right at the very beginning, even if you haven't done your audit yet. Um, the one back, we our screen may <laughs> there we go, great. Um, then uh, as in the far right, the DOBR money is going to come in as a uh, as well as the utility incentives are going to come in at the end of the project after the installation is done as a reimbursement. Going bottom left, we have a box for securing financing. And that can happen in a number of places. Um, for towns who are on this call, the, the key for you guys is town meeting. Um, you're going to need a spring meeting, and that's coming up for many of you soon. Um, and we can work with you to help figure out what a cost estimate would be for the project and how to put that on the warrant so you can get that approval to go out for financing. Um, I'll talk more about this later. Some communities do bonding, some communities do a lease purchase, and the lease purchase is nice because uh, a lot of banks do this. You don't have to do the, the, all the work of a bond, and uh, if you still get great, great packs. Um, and then I have a, a quote out here that says, "Apply for the utility incentive." That just has to happen before you do um, before you uh, purchase, purchase your product and, and do the install. So um, that's sort of the rough process. I'm going to go into each of those steps right now. The audit that's been mentioned conducted by a third-party expert within the last three years, 
And if you have done something like this with municipal staff or you really think you've got the staff to do it, you can apply for a waiver through us. Um, and what that's going to give you is the GPS location of each poll, which is important for your design process. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, now there's a little map here that shows sort of the wattages. You're going to be able to get a GPS data that you can map um, and go into your existing GIS systems, showing different wattages and different um, poll configurations. And that will also give you point to each light, all the attributes that are going to be relevant to your design and future maintenance. Those are things like what existing technology is it, the watch pole type, the height of it, the arm length, et cetera, some things like that. Um, you're also going to get attributes that help you prepare uh, for insulation and better budget for it. You're going to find out, is there existing damage? Are there blockages with vegetation? Is there corrosion? And these things that you know could affect the cost um, or, or, or certainly would slow an installer down and make a change order in the field and finding those out at the time is, is really valuable uh, finally uh, <clears throat> there's usually a, a, a thing where they compare what found in the field to the utilities billing you for and that could be helpful to um, reconcile any differences and possibly result in some savings the design process here, you know, I think I want to stress how important design can be. You're really trying to figure out what's the light level for your community, and these are going to lights are going to be in at least 10 years, if not 20. So getting right is important, and you want to figure out how really how far down can you go because you'd like to get as much energy savings as possible. Um, and so you have your existing high pressure sodium lights. Designers are going to help you figure out well what amount of light is that putting out now. Then we can look, your designer can help you look to the um, some standards out there, like what's called RP8. And that would be for like a, a development where you could put each pole in its right place and um, you could really be precise. But since we're working with existing poles that weren't going to move, um, there's some limitations now whether you can hit that. And you can kind of compare um, what the pole LEDs you're going to put in, how those compare to what, what you have existing, what the standard is. And see what you know, what's right, and where, how really, how far you could go down um, in wattage hit the right light levels. You can do a potential pilot project, um, install a few to see if it really matches up. And Chris will talk a bit about his experience with that. And of course, the design process is also going to talk about different product options. So color temperature is one that I mentioned before, and we're seeing more and more communities do the 3000K, which is a little bit more yellow, a uh, little bit warmer color. You want metal versus plastic components uh, more, but it could be more durable. And warranty, uh, for 10 years, but some do vary. So um, that, that's what a designer is going to help you think through. So you, you can basically set the parameters for what type of, for the, for the product you want to go out to bid for. And then when we do product selection, you're going to be comparing the price to get back with the other, the other elements. You know, do they, do they, Achieve the right light levels, wattage, and then based on you know what's the total energy use. So um, you may you may have two different products that hit the, same, hit the right light levels for you, but one does it with more energy, and so there's you're not going to be saving as much with that. Um, also, you know how do, you, how do they qualify for incentives? One may help you get a little bit more on incentives than, than others. And the material quality, like I talked about before, in addition to some other things. So you'll, you'll, you'll select your product, um, kind of considering a lot of those different factors. And the designer can help you think through those. And then you've got the, the project management element. So you know once you've selected the, that, the fixture and we've gone up to bid for it, they can help coordinate the delivery of those fixtures. They're going to work with the installer to help, you know, build the right schedule that works with the city and keeps things orderly. Um, they can assist with the change orders that do come up and kind of help, help manage those. Uh, they're also going to be receiving updates from installers uh, on a pretty regular regular basis um, and making sure that what, what they said should get installed does get installed. Uh, and that's it's pretty important to have thousands of lights going in. Um, they'll verify the incident is complete to their to their standards, and uh, they'll also assist you with the utility incentive. So pretty, um, uh, I think, valuable to have on, and um, definitely it makes seamless projects. Uh, so, so 
looking at the retrofit process graph here again, um, the sort of what parties would be involved. So from I guess this is from the project that MAPC is meant to manage. Um, what we can see is that the we'll call them a designer. They often can provide the services of the audit. So everything yellow essentially. They can do the audit. They do the design. They help you select the product, and they can do that QA and project management. They can they can be on board for all of that. The installer in blue, obviously performing installation, the th you know third part installer. Um, where MAPC comes involved would be on the on the orange. It's time to procure the product, and then time to in, um, procure the installation labor. That's where the community is working with us. Would we would work with you? And we'll look to see which communities are ready around the same time for those for the um, service, procuring product or procuring installation. And what we'll do is we'll work together to develop the minimum criteria for the um, for the scope, minimum qualifications, um, and we'll really lead that with. Um, and if we're working with the designer, we'll be bring them into the process to make sure that things are seamlessly. And we'll try to do some collective procurements. And we've had a lot of success with this in the past in terms of minimizing uh, administrative work and um, getting good pieces. So we're really excited that we are wants to do that. Um, and we're yeah, looking forward to getting started with that in the very near term. We know some communities are, um, you know, they've got their design pretty much ready to go and are ready to go out and get, get product or even get install. So after this, I know some a lot of communities have already contacted us. We'll be following up um, to really start talking about about next steps for those who are, are ready to, to get moving um, on that standpoint. So financing, I just want to talk about that briefly. Um, what you want to do is get their funding or financing for 100% of the estimated cost of the retrofit. And MAPC will, uh, we have a calculator, we can help, um, we can, we'll do the, that we'll make an estimate for you based on whatever inventory you have of streetlights. And that should be a concern estimate, so you should have, um, you know, going, financing for that amount should be fine. So we'll help you figure that out. But both the DOER and utility in, um, incentives are going to be reimbursement, as I mentioned. So that comes after, you know, you'll have to have enough money appropriated to sign a contract up front. Um, for the portion of funding that remains to be covered by the municipality after the grants and the incentives have come in, you can use Green Communities Grant Funding to cover that that portion of the, the municipal match. So um, that can definitely be, be combined. For the point that you need to cover that you might not have green communities funding for um, after the DOER and utility incentives are subtracted, what we see communities doing is they either use a bond or they use a tax-exempt lease purchase. And the bond, um, they're, they're both great options. There's some really low interest rates now, so bonds bonds can be great. The tax exempt lease purchase we've seen a lot of communities do, and um, some examples. I think we have we have plenty of examples to, to show you if if you want to talk through that. But it's a it's a pretty simple process. A lot of banks offer this, um, so financing is definitely available. But again, you'd, if you're a town, you'd really want to get on your warrant to um, get approval to be able to sign that kind of deal. And again, we can talk about what that cost would be. To talk through quickly some actual project costs, we see backs tend to be five to seven years with utility incentives. And again, again um, these are gonna last for probably 20 years. Conservatively, I'm just gonna estimate that $400 per light will cover everything from that audit through the end of the project with, with installation project management. Um, we're hoping to get that lower, and we definitely think we can. But again, I want to be conservative with when people are getting financing and things. Um, and on that $400, we usually see one of our past projects. Have 
have kind of ended up being around like $80 per light and, and could definitely be higher. Uh, as you'll hear, the incentives are based on how much energy you save. So um, that it, it can vary. Uh, and then, <clears throat> so that save brings you down to maybe three, $320 per light. Utility incentives, um, we see maybe $40 in energy savings a year. Uh, on these, that doesn't include maintenance savings, um, which I mentioned before. So that doesn't include maintenance, so that, that, that's not to add on there. Um, and then, of course, <clears throat> the total cost is going to get driven down with the 30% DOER grant that we add in. So I think hopefully you're going to be, a lot of people are going to be looking at PAX less than five years. Um, and uh, that could be a great opportunity to look at wireless controls as well. So we'll talk a little bit about that more. This is just a table that shows some of the, like the, where, where these savings actually come from in terms of the, the distribution and supply costs um, with and without a retrofit. So I'll send that out and people can look at it, but that's sort of an example of how you get to that, that four to one number. Um, utility bills. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is wireless controls. So <clears throat> right now, you're not going to improve your, your pay from the energy bill perspective by installing wireless controls. And again, these would be controls that allow you to dim or even turn off um, at certain parts of the night to save, to reduce energy use and light levels. City of Cambridge, for example, I believe dims all of the lights by about 30% um, or somewhere around 11 o'clock at night. And really interesting is that you get over 30% dimming, the human eye really can't perceive it very well. So you uh, get a fair bit of energy savings right there and light potentially rich from dimming. Um, but right now, there's not additional uh, savings. But there are savings on maintenance because with the wireless controls, you'll have information coming back to a central software system that would be able to report outages and any issues that are going on. So um, there can definitely likely be cost savings. You'd be able to even extend the life of the fixtures because while they're rated for a very long time, they do have uh, what are called drivers, and those could possibly burn out. And by dimming, you're running them less and um, possibly helping to ensure that your light uh, exist even longer. And then there are some um, additional functions that you'll hear from um, when Tom Westwood talks about how you can tap into other uh, systems and other wireless capabilities uh, around town. Um, and what be mentioned is that the wireless controls tend to be composed of three parts. You have a node which exists on each light, and you those are the the, um, there's a photo cell that gets used, and they, that photo wants to communicate. Those usually talk back, they kind of talk to each other, and they try to talk back to a central central system. Um, and they talk back through these gateways. So they basically send their system, their signals back to a few different gateways that will be positioned around town. Um, and then, then you have your software, which runs it. Um, there's a few communities in the state who have done this so far. We've got Westwood, Randolph, Cambridge, I think, are the three. And right now we're seeing costs that will be around $150 per light extra on top of the, the cost, um, as well as annual uh, software costs. But um, you think, so I think that with the extra 30% that we are is offering, the LED retrofit really already made a lot of economic sense on its own with just utility incentives. I think uh, it would be great if um, some communities wanted to sort of use some of that extra savings from the DOER grant to see if you could fund yep. wireless controls. Um, we're ready to work with anyone who's who's interested in that and, uh, and even just to explore it. So uh, with that, <clears throat> I'm going to wrap up. I'm just going to look at one question that might have popped in before I go on. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I'll move on for time, and we'll do Q right at the end here. Uh, so, we'll over to Chris in Northampton. Hello. <laughs> Um, I want to start off by saying thank you to MAPC because um, the, um, the lighting upgrade that we did in Northampton was uh, procured by MAPC where they did a, 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 through a, a performance co contract for 25A with a number of towns. And we threw it in there and not even being committed to doing it. And the um, results came back good in that it was pretty much of a no-brainer for us to, to go ahead. Um, uh, we didn't have any grant funding for it, just to let you know, um, and with the after utility rebate, our payback will be a little over four years. Um, we felt that they could cover that. Okay, so um, uh, to dive in, try to this fast. Um, where we started from, in Northampton, back in the 1990s, uh, the city had gone through an effort to uniform, make their lights more uniform. They had, uh, we had bought about 90% of our lights. Um, the utility at that point, uh, and uh, uh, overall, I understand I wasn't working here at that time, but the um, uh, a lot of lights were taken out, some lights were added in, and the the general effort was to make the community more uniform. So, you live in any residential area, you basically had similar lights. Um, uh, the same for uh, you know the large fee streets, the arterial roads, and then the urban centers. They were similar. So, that's what I'm looking at right there. Um, when, when uh, Siemens um, uh, was our installation contractor, they started off by doing an investment created audit. And uh, that information, as Patrick has mentioned, or someone mentioned earlier, that um, you know that was fed into our GIS. Um, our GIS folks came up with this map. Um, I'll say uh, that uh, this was incredibly helpful, although it added a lot of time to our project because when we dove into this, seen places where um, things didn't look like um, uh, that 10 percent of lights that we hadn't bought it turns out they were still you know often oversized and um, a little bit too dense there were places where the city recognized uh, that certain certain residential neighborhoods had a higher level of lighting than others and those tend, uh, tended to be cut through streets um, that were heavily used during uh, uh, times of high traffic um, uh, our industrial park was incredibly le well lit. It was, was booming with light. It was like an airport. Um, uh, so uh, through this process, we actually went through pretty detailed uh, the inventory and tweaked um, uh, what we wanted in the uh, in the in the lighting. Um, so some of the residential streets that were passed through, we just dropped them down to the normal lighting. After we checked with the DPW, we checked with the police department. Um, you know, wanted to make sure there wasn't an issue with safety, so we ordered those lights. Um, uh, there are a few places we made it more consistent where um, we were buying the, the last 10% of our lights. The real park went down, went from 250 watts on every single pole. We put, we brought it down to a residential level, which is about 50. Well, high pressure sodium would be 50 watts. So actually, for us, this could be 19 watts on every other pole. Um, uh, uh, and I thought that was really worth doing because you had a very good understanding of um, how it impact the, the city and how you, know, how you could be e evenly distributed. We didn't take into account the standards because the city had done this in the 90s and we just based it basically on what the, the, the city had decided then. Um, want to go to the slide? So um, the, uh, the contractor proposed a number of lights for us, and at this time they were proposing the 4,000 Kelvin lights. Um, uh, the city was already hearing from, from some community members that they, they were worried about the blue light, and so we asked uh, for the contractor to give us sample lights at 3,000 Kelvin as well. Um, and we did a, um, a, a pilot test. Uh, there's a little map here that people go online and they could find where these lights were and there was an online feedback form that they could use um, and um, uh, I will say that 3000 K was the lowest we went to because um, the, uh, the national grid will give a rebate to anything that is um, uh, that is in the design like consortium qualified product list and at the moment uh, lights haven't gotten below 3000 K if they if they have it, 
it, it wasn't available when we put these lights in. 3000K was, if we went lower in color temperature, we would have lost our rebate. Um, so that's where um, uh, we ended up because the community did prefer the warmer, whiter, you know, the warmer lights. Um, we all got a, a bit of pushback on, on the light levels. And uh, you a little chart to the right over there um, shows where we actually ended up. Uh, and this was very helpful. Our contractor helped us uh, realize that with, with the high pressure sodium lights, there's an initial um, lumen level that the lights put out. But that rapidly drops down to um, a kind of a mean level with, uh, uh, that the pressure sodium is, is more in this mean range, so it's a lower light level. And then depending on uh, some light characteristics, you can calculate a perceived light level. So um, you'll notice if you look at the mean and versus the perceived, the, um, the high pressure sodium lights, the ones under the HID lumen values, um, the perceived light level is actually lower than the actual lumen level. It's not very good with your eyes. It doesn't work very well. Or on the other hand, the Leotech, which is the, the LEDs that we went with, the mean level when it's, when it's uh, converted into a perceived level is actually higher. Um, and our aim was to, to uh, certainly not have a perceived light level that was above um, the old light level. And largely because of community input, you'll notice that some of the higher wattage ones, the ones on the bottom rows, the light level is actually lower than the, um, uh, actually in a number of those cases, our perceived lighting level um, is lower than the uh, high pressure sodium's perceived lighting level. And yet we'll say that the community in general believes that our lights are as bright, if not brighter, than the, um, uh, than the old lights. Um, and uh, that's not accurate. The lights actually are, are pretty less light, but they they're very effective at um, lighting up. Uh, they, they work well with your eyes, is the way I've come to put it. Um, uh, we also did a second community input. Um, actually, not quite yet. Go back to the other. Other. It doesn't matter. We can do either one. Um, uh, because we were still getting more pushback on um, the, what the community saw as glare, and the second. Um, study that we did happened to be on a very narrow street with houses right up against the road. And it became pretty obvious to us that the community had, had a point. Um, uh, that particularly you had a narrow street, the lights wash out over houses a lot. And uh, so we took one more effort. We went through and used GIS to identify the locations where it was pretty obvious we were, we're going to want to shield the lights. And we put that into the, um, uh, into the program before the installation happened. So we pretty shielded a number of lights from light shining on, on onto people's houses. We also then put in place, um, back in the 90s, the city had instigated a way for people to ask for a change in lighting. And basically that meant they could ask to have a light put back in at a, at a street light. Um, well, we've modified that so that residents now can ask to either add, remove, or fire a street light. Um, uh, we have had one case where someone was asked to remove a light. It happened to have been at an old school that was no longer functioning, and so it was pretty obvious that was a little section that was overlit. We um, agreed to that. Um, uh, and there was, for, for the most part, though, people were asking for, for shields or a way to stop light from coming into the house. Um, probably around 1% of, uh, of the of the lights out there. Um, uh, okay, go on to the next slide. Um, and with this, we certainly do have a small group of people in Northampton that um, uh, feel that this project was done, was back for the city. It, um, uh, they feel that it's too bright, too blue, um, and uh, um, don't like the lights. But there's quite people that also they really like the lights. Just so this is good, this could come out. Um, I did find uh, this uh, chart was passed on to me um, by a contractor. It's from um, put out by the one of the labs. And look, um, the CCT that's the color temperature. Uh, second row down, you see the 3,000 um, Kelvin um, has about 18 to 25 percent blue light. Bolded line in the middle, high pressure sodium, has about 10% blue light. Um, so what we did, we took the mean lumens, 
um, the overall lumens that we're about to install, multiply the percent blue, blue lumens, in order to get the amount of blue light, um, or you know, the percent. And we did that with the high pressure sodium and the LEDs. Um, uh, and what we've come out with is that the after the LED installs, we're actually producing about 58% less light than we were before. So we, we're producing a lot less light as, as it did before. And the light change, because we don't know exactly where that, um, that 18 to 25% our lights are, the range will either be dropping by about a quarter, by about 24%, possibly being about 6% more blue light. Um, and I, we felt this was a, uh, an important data point to be able to provide for our community. Uh, I want to say also, uh, we were speaking about dimming. Um, the city put in seven um, uh, uh, connectors so that we could put in dimming. But at the moment, if we if we went with controllers, um, the national grid does not have a rate a way of um, of to count the dimmed. LEDs. Uh, so, uh, and, and on top of that, we felt that when they do, do put that error in, they might really want to know is the meter that's associated with that um, um, neutral actually revenue grade. In other words, can they trust the amount of where lights actually at? And so, so set that aside at the moment. But with that said, we modified our lights and kind of changed the light levels that went in. And all lighting levels that are in the residential neighborhoods, the, the lights have already been uh, dimmed to their lowest level. So um, uh, we can't dim them any, anymore. They're, they're at their lowest level possible. The ones in the urban areas, um, and particularly the ones that are crosswalks and intersections that are even brighter uh, in the urban areas, um, can be dimmed. And, and, and in the future, we will be looking at that once there is a array uh, that allows us to um, actually take credit for it. Um, now, I will have to brag on the city as environmental uh, because, you know, environmentally, by dinner our lights, we are actually paying National Grid um, even more for their electricity uh, per, kilowatt, per, per kilowatt hour because we've got a dim light, but they're still going to charge us at the top wattage for that light. Um, uh, but it's still, I think, it's, you know, worth doing because the community, um, uh, is, that's what they prefer. That's what they want. Um, and I think go to the next slide. To wrap up, uh, we'll say that uh, so on our website we have a frequently asked questions, um, and there's the uh, URL above on the very top up there um, that you can click on these. I will say that we um, we blatantly stole some of this from other communities who have gone through this, but it was uh, it was a very good way of communicating to the community afterwards at the end. Is put together a um, a, a frequently asked questions piece and have that available. Um, people can go online and, and look at them, and, and you're welcome to steal it from us as well if you want to. Um, and about that does it. I, um, I'll take any questions uh, when questions are, are being asked. Thank you very much, Chris. We really appreciate that. So now we'll turn it over to Tom Philbin from Westwood. Uh, again, and I uh, apologize for not having a good slide presentation, but uh, I'll, I'll talk to pretty much the same things that were just uh, done by Chris. Uh, what uh, this they wanted to, to cut back on the consumption in general as a part of a broad uh, community's effort to cut our overall town consumption by 20% over five years. And the street lights were uh, among the contributors to some of the consumption. We did an analysis of the town, and we had about 70 accounts. And looked at the 70 accounts. If you took the top four accounts, you had 90% of the total energy consumption in the town. So we decided then to concentrate on those 14 accounts, which includes the schools, the high school, and in fact, the, the high school and the middle school were over 50% of the total town. So we, we kind of identified what were the major sources of the consumption, and streetlights were one of them. So we decided to do the streetlights. We brought up at a town meeting, got a, a $1,000, essentially, allotment of, from the town to go street light program. We got approximately uh, 8,000 of incentives from uh, and we got another uh, 8 or so that we took our green community grant and applied to the street lights. So 
So all that together gave us plenty of money to do the project. And to the extent now that we have expanded, that we had monies left over when we were finished, and we used that to do all of the decorative in the town, and we uh, did all of the lights have the uh, communication devices that were installed as well. So plenty of money. So that was that made the process very very easy. In the design process, we hired Light Smart, a company headed up by George Woodbury, to help design the program. And George helped with the surveys. Very knowledgeable man, and made our lives very interesting. Helped with the purchasing process. We, the lights and so forth. Uh, used Cree fixtures. We have a, a Fulton Kelvin. It's interesting that we tried the same thing. We showed the, th the three options, and it was universal that the people preferred the full house. And since we've installed it, we've actually uh, gotten compliments from Motown. We've had really no negative comments on the light, which is you know, one uh, case where they claim it, it, it's right in their living room. It affected, and we put shields up there as well. So, on one of the uh, street lights where they were retrofitted, we put shields to prevent the light from shining in toward the house. And we did send them some Eversource, as I said. Eversource was a great help, and they were very, very prompt in, in giving the, and approving the incentives that we applied for. It took a year. Most of the, the delays in our project in getting the equipment itself. A Cree at the time was uh, changing some of their management and they had all the excuses as to why they were delayed in shipping, but it took a while longer than we have ever anticipated to get the lighting out. We did also, as I said, installed a streetlight vision program from Silvering's network. And the object of installing that system is if you're familiar with the Light communicates with each light in a sort of a uh, self-healing network, and it's up a radio frequency mesh over the whole town. And that mesh is established. We look at any light. We are supposed to be able to look at any light, and if it's on, we can exercise it. We can dim it. We do all of that remotely from a computer terminal here in the PW building. I have to say that we're having a lot of software problems. The uh, system. In terms of telling us what's happening, SOAR is approximately, I'd say, about 75% of the information that we expected. We did have we have monies that we're going to be paying for the software maintenance. Uh, held up all those payments uh, pending a new version of the software, which is supposed to be coming out. The system that uh, Spring sells is used in Europe quite successfully, so I'm not sure what the problems are here. But it's great when you turn it on because we I can immediately I can get a map, I see what lights are on and what are off. I get a report on a daily basis telling me that these lights are not are not communicating. Uh, you get the lights are out for some reason. You can tell that they're out if the if the power is uh, you know out for some reason. But then there are a bunch of lights that for some don't communicate. Finding out that if a two of the lights are more than 15 hundredths apart, they don't communicate. So in some of the neighborhoods where they have very few of the lights, we found where they got to the first light that was uh, distant from the next light by more than 1,500 yards, that whole neighborhood no longer communicated. So working on that now by installing a series of repeaters. We have a series of what they call access points in the town, which are not expensive items, but we put three of them that were supposed to cover the whole town. Uh, they're all up and working now, but it looks like we're going to have to put as three or four more of the repeaters. They cost, you know, 50 bucks or so, these repeaters, but it's more installation costs and get somebody out to put them in that, that, that runs the price up. But when we put the repeaters in, we expect we'll have the entire system uh, to the point where we can see every pole. And then we can see every poll, we can solve software problems that uh, we seem to be having. They were firm with problems in the communication devices themselves, the warranty, and then when they didn't work right, we would just, just uh, we took them out and replaced them. Uh, we did have about out of the 1,100 uh, cobra that we installed, 
we've had three or four fail. Uh, we get under warranty, they get replaced right away, so it's not a major cost. Although the warranty doesn't cover the labor. We have labor costs that ranged anywhere from, believe it or not, uh, 55 to 65 a fixture. The extra 10 being, if you install the communication device, all the way to 110 a fixture. Uh, for me, when we got the bids in, we got seven bids, and there was almost two to one. And the lowest bidder, it turned out, had more experience than most of the others, and I think that might have been a factor in some of the the bids. They didn't understand what they were doing, especially with the communication devices. They kind of ran the price up so they could cover any contingencies. Pardon me? Hey, this is Patrick. If you could take another minute or so, that would be great. Sure. Um, Thanks. So on these now, we have an outside contractor, and the overall cost and payback, because the cost, the payback is about four, four and a half years, um, excluding the uh, control devices. So we have all of that in now, and in the town is very, very happy with the result. We've seen definitive reductions in our electric bill. So the, the lights that we have are on a calculated basis. We've seen the reduced uh, utility rates almost immediately. And so far, it's amounting to about 700 bucks a month, which is quite, quite significant. So that's general. Any other questions, I'd be happy to answer later on. Great. So much, Tom. Uh, great. We're going to turn it over here to um, Mike Skinner from National Grid, and then we'll hear a little bit from Eversource, uh, and then we'll hit questions. Mike, making sure you're not muted. Here you go. Mike, perhaps muted on your phone? Source can go next if you want it. <laughs> Uh, that that sounds good. Um, do you guys want to do that, and then we can. Oh, no, right. Why don't we? Why don't we? Yeah, into the uh, the process. Um, I realize you had some slides here, but uh, it's a cover slide. Oh, it's a cover slide. Okay. But um, I'll let Kevin really out outline our process. The, the process for all the utilities, we work under the same program, a save program. It's going to be virtually the same. Uh, the intention was to have Mike Skinner do his presentation. Then we'd talk about any slight differences or any other requirements that the source uh, um, um, has. But um, I'll turn it over to Kevin Morley. He's our reviewing engineer, and he's done, you know, We've done, I think, 75% of the municipally owned streetlight uh, conversions to LED in our territory. Uh, so um, we have a lot of experience working with municipalities like Tom Fibbon and Westwood um, most recently. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Kevin. He'll give a, uh, a brief overview of our process. The process is sort of like you described, Patrick. We do get, like to get involved early. We do like to uh, stress having an expert come in and do an evaluation. You know, the conception is is that it's a simple one-to-one -one replacement looking at lumens to lumens. And really, you need to take a back, you know, like was described with Northampton, take a look at what is the required light you needed for that space. Is it residential, commercial, industrial? You know, what was there before? I mean, you, we were on one residential street where there was, uh, you know, 250 watts uh, sodium installed there. And it's really not necessary. So. To have someone go in there and do that evaluation is very important. So we've been supportive of that effort as well as far as an engineering services application and a study to really look at you the know, needs of the town, you know, the security, the levels per space type, and that's been something that we've been trying to promote uh, right off the bat. So that's the, the first uh, program and pathway that we offer as far as the engineering service is component. And then doing that, like you said, we do like to get in early as far as reviewing the application to see, as was also described in the Northampton application, 
is a quality fixture, is it on the DLC list, does it meet our uh, requirements internally here. Uh, after that is uh, goes through after the application is processed, the customer will read that pre-approval letter with that set amount listed on it. After the installation is completed, uh, receive just a notification and some sort of proof of purchase of the, all the fixtures and the completed inventory as well. So we send that on to billing. As uh, Tom described, these are metered accounts in, in the most part, for the most part. So those have to be sent to our billing department. We do have a inventory that's provided. Uh, we can share it with you if you can use that to do your installations. That makes the build dates a, a lot easier. That's what happened in the case of Westwood. We got it immediately from their vendor and we're able to send that right down to billing. So he noticed the savings on the bill right away. Uh, last thing to talk about is communities that haven't purchased their uh, lights yet. That process is relatively simple as well. You would just contact your account executive with uh, Eversource or your community relations specialist. That request would then go to our plan accounting who develops a uh, fixture inventory and a purchase price for the uh, for the fixtures themselves. Um, if the municipality agrees to grow forward, a bill of sale is then created for signature and acceptance. And then after that, a transition date is uh, determined and uh, you can basically start your conversion any time after that. So that sums it up for Eversource. I think we're fairly consistent with uh, National Grid. Yeah, great. thank you very much. Uh, we're just going to try to get Mike on here, see if uh, this works. Hi, Pat, can you hear me? Hey, Mike, all right, great, we can hear you. Um, uh, yeah, if you could just kind of give, give us the Cliff Notes version, that would be great. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry about that. Um, we're all straightened out now. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk to you today. Again, I'm Mike Stern, National Grid field, uh, Senior Field Sales Rep. Um, basically, we talk about the application uh, for converting uh, streetlights to LED. Um, one of the questions we always seem to get asked is, you know, when's the right time to actually reach out to the National Grid uh, of the application? Uh, so that uh, is essentially pretty much once you've decided to move forward with the project. You know, maybe during the, you know, the audit stage or after you've made the final selection on fixtures, um, just need to be notified. You know, the earlier the better, really. Uh, step in the process uh, to submit a custom application for the project. Uh, application should be submitted uh, to National Grid uh, Energy Efficiency Rep. Um, you can submit those to me directly, uh, and I can get them over to the appropriate people. Um, and once the applications are received, uh, they're set up in our work management system, and then they're sent for internal engineering review. Project must pass the BCR in order to be eligible for an incentive. Uh, most all energy efficiency applications do hire a pre-inspection to, you know, to confirm the existing fixture wattage and the count. Uh, however, with the street lights, we waive that just because of the volume involved. Uh, once the application is clear engineering review, the offer letter is sent out to the customer, and typically the customer's vendor, just so everybody's on the same page with that. Uh, LED street lights are in size at 25 cents per kilowatt hour saved which is on the first year annual KWH savings. I think to remember uh, in some application um, is uh, you want to get that national grid incentive commitment letter um, in hand before you order the equipment. You know, to do so may deem the project ineligible for an incentive as it would be assumed that the project's going to move forward irregardless of the incentive. And that's the whole idea of, you know, the incentive. Um, as far as checklist, um, basically, the uh, thing you want to do is reach out to uh, me or your sales rep, and we will email you a, co um, a copy of the custom application, a custom lighting tool, and a design form. You'll want that custom lighting tool to your vendor for completion so that they can fill it out. Once you receive that back from them, um, then we would need that completed, signed, and dated come application along with a copy of the proposal, material and labor breakout. The material breakout is needed for the BCR run during the engineering review, so it's quite critical that we have that document, otherwise it can hold everything up. Um, we cut sheets for each different type of fixture, as well as proof that the fixtures are current DLC listed products. Again, we'll need the custom lighting tool, as well as completed sign and dated W9 form. This is a complete application, which will ensure you know, that it's through the, our systems smoothly and quickly, um, basically through that review process. 
Uh, once all construction is complete with the project, um, we'll need to submit a final invoice and material and labor breakout. We will perform a post inspection on the project and we, and we need your vendor installer to, to provide the bills or scope of work documents for reference. And we do post inspect 10% of the street lights and we'll work closely with your vendor installer during this process. And Patrick had spoken about that earlier on his slide. That actually is a very critical point in the process where we want our post inspector to be able to have a direct connection with your um, whoever the product manager is or your vendor so that we can coordinate on that. That process goes very smoothly. Everything gets turned around quickly. Um, a successful completion of the post inspection, the project is sent for final payment. The incentive check is made and mailed to the payee indicated on the application. The check can be sent to the vendor to the vendor as long as that is clearly indicated on the application. Um, and receive the W-9 form for the vendor in addition to the W-9 form we need from the municipality. Um, just miscellaneous points here. Um, we want to get pre-approval on, on the project before material is ordered and work construction begins. Uh, the vendor installer performing the actual LED lighting retrofit, a fixture retrofit, will be required to be an OSHA qualified electrical worker in order to perform work within this close proximity to primary and secondary wires. I think it's a 30 inch clearance um, on the primaries and three inches on the secondary wires for these uh, lumens. Some of them can be within inches of the primary. So um, these guys need to have this qualification. The time of the retrofit, disconnect fuses are required to be installed in line before the fixture. Uh, and the post inspection is required and we do inspect 10% of fixtures during the audit. As was mentioned before, wireless controls are not eligible for incentives at this time as the street lights are not metered, so there is no way to confirm the KWH savings realized by reducing operating hours and our wattages. Uh, there is no mechanism in the tariff uh, for this either. When implementing a street light upgrade, it's a good time to consider to consolidate most or all of the street light accounts to a single S5 rate account. Uh, this can be coordinated with the town's national grid or your town's national grid customer and community representative. The um, town has one, and every town knows who that person is, um, and that would bring all the streetlight accounts in under one account. Um, the towns have ended up with several streetlight accounts over the years, actually quite a few, and all these streetlight accounts are paid out of the same budget. This contains everything under one account and makes things much easier in the end. Um, that's much the application process here with National Grid. Uh, Mike, thank you very much. And for everyone, um, as part of the follow-up with this, I will be sending out contact information. So I think as both Mike um, and Mark and Steve, you know, made it clear, contacting the uh, the really reps early on is, is is important. Get in touch with them and make sure they're aware of that you're um, going to be approving this process, and they can work hand in hand with you throughout the throughout the the whole process. Um, so we wrapped up a little over an hour. Thank you for being patient with us. Uh, we're going to go to some questions here. And again, we've got the Q&A box. So if you can use that, that'd be great. Um, so we've got a few things here. Um, I think, actually, just before we get to questions, I wanted to a couple of things that came up when Chris, Chris and uh, Tom's presentation. You know, one of the things Tom mentioned, or sorry, Chris mentioned was even though the actual lighting levels um, are are a little bit lower with some of their their new lights. The town, the community feels like they're higher, and he he said that you know he frames frames that as a work with your eyes, and I think that that is getting at that sort of improved color rendering index, um, which helps to, you know illuminate things better. I think that's one of those that that that's um, the community sort of really experiencing that benefit. Um, and then you know Chris also brought up in the design process they were looking at crosswalks and intersections. That's a that, that's really a, a place where your, where your designer can add value to help you figure out. You, know, you might have four lights at this intersection. Is that really needed? Or conversely, maybe you have some tough spots in town, and maybe there maybe there is enough light there where there really should be, and they can help you look at some of those um, more complex areas as opposed in addition to just the you know regular um, regular streets. And then on the, on the wireless controls, I think that it's really encouraging, you know, that communities like Westwood have been able to move ahead with with some of these controls, um, even though not a payback right now, 
um, at least on the energy side. But and, and of course, I did hear you know, Tom uh, when that's when you're setting up this sort of wireless mesh, as he mentioned. You know, all the streetlights are essentially trying to talk to each other, and if you have a gap. Sometimes you need to install um, some technology to help it bridge that that gap, uh, that physical distance. So um, hopefully, it sounds like once those get you know ironed out, uh, you have this really robust network. And I think that would probably be expected with a lot of deployments. That the, the beginning part is going to be based on your geography. You're going to need to figure out there are going to be some dead spots, and then as you mentioned, you know, you can install some individual devices that are only fifty dollars each or something like that. Uh, so, yeah, so it was great. And I think Tom mentioned that in Westwood, they were looking at about a four and a half year payback without the controls. I think from our previous conversations, Tom, you had mentioned that it was about six years or six and a half years with the controls. So, um, just nice to see that that didn't, you know, didn't double the cost. It didn't double the payback. It, it did increase it just, but just a little bit. Um, so, I think we've got some questions here now. Um, one was for Tom. Um, they asked about maintenance. So for a lot of communities, maintenance is done with a, 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 um, a fee per light per month that covers basic like on-call services. And so if a light's out, you know, someone will come and, and replace it. They usually do some drive-bys to see if there's any lights out. Someone was wondering, Tom, with, with, the, with the wireless control system, has that changed? How you contract for maintenance? Um, do you do you have you gotten rid of that that standard fee per light? And do you just do you just do like a time and materials when there's a light that's out? No, it depends. Again, it is a standard fee that we have for overheads for the removal, and same a different one for the decorative lights. But the fee every time we call them is much per light. We usually that we have more than one. Uh, but the fee is fixed, and in terms of the system, is supposed to tell us that a light is out or malfunctioning. So we don't call them unless the system tells us there's a reason to call. Right now, one of the frustrations with the system is we're getting false information. And at first, we had them come out, and it turned out there was no problem. Uh, now we go and check ourselves, and we're finding that sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. So uh, the system is the system does not seem to reset. So, for example, there's a power outage on the grid, and all lights then report they're not working, and then back on. For some reason, a lot of them don't reset to the fact that they're to turn on. So they stay in an off position, which would give you false lead. So we're we're dealing with a lot of these software problems right now. All right, great. Well, um, yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I think that that is probably true. That there's definitely some work out in the beginning, and um, I think other, I know Cambridge has had a really, once they've gotten some of their geographic issues um, working, they've had a really successful deployment of their of their wireless controls. Um, so in Cambridge, if I may add, yeah, Cambridge is lucky in the sense yeah. that they they have the distance between the lights that the towns do. Uh, Cambridge obviously is a densely populated area, and there's point really do you get more than a hundred, couple hundred feet between lights. Whereas in a town like ours, you might go to a we have neighborhoods where the people don't want street lights or to have lights on their own property. So it's a different mix of things to deal with. Got it. Um, great. Well, a couple other questions here. Um, one was uh, just re recapping the, the length of life. Um, we had a question for the LEDs. So as we mentioned earlier, they are most of the Cobra heads are warranted at about 10 years and should last. Um, at least they're sort of inventory tested to last for over 20 years, but no LEDs have yet been installed for that long, so we have yet to see. Um, to see. The, um, you know, someone else, someone else asked, asked, did we have some evidence that, that these actually really do uh, re return savings? And um, I think that uh, from what we heard from, from Tom and um, you guys are just at the very beginning of seeing the things come in, but across the state now, uh, we've had yeah, there's probably at least 40 to 40 communities. Um, in addition to the entire 
cape that is retrofitted in communities are so far seeing the promised energy savings and um, the, the maintenance savings. Uh, on the maintenance piece, we had a question about what are what are the typical costs. So generally, when you're, you're looking at the existing high pressure sodium lights, those tend to cost one dollar per light per month for the that um, essentially like the, the basic maintenance. So when there's a light out go out and replace it, um, they cover the labor for that. They might have a call center that residents can report a village to, and um, you know, they handle getting uh, newts ordered and things like that. Um, so that's about, what, $12 per light per year, and it does um, it does mean you'd also have to have separate pot money for some of the um, on routine things like if there's a pole that gets knocked down or you need or or a light gets damaged by a tree and you need to buy a new one um, and we can help you look at that we have kind of a formula for what you should decide um, on an annual basis the, the nice thing is that when you look at it compared well compared to where the what you're paying with the rate it ends up it ends up being lower but um, the units cost um, when you <clears throat> move to an LED light, tend to fall from that one dollar per light per month to fifty cents per light per month, or um, possibly a little a little lower. So you definitely get some great maintenance savings there. And most of the fact that they're going to go out a lot less and uh, require a lot less a lot less field work. Someone asked, do the utilities own the lights by default? And the answer there would be yes. I believe it was in 1997 we had the electric structuring law. I, I that was the the milestone when which allowed municipalities to to purchase their lights back. Um, I might be wrong on that, but some communities took advantage of that over the last say 20 years. Again, because there was often uh, there generally are significant maintenance savings. Um, and so some are in a position to retrofit right away. Others are looking at. Um, looking at retrofitting now and, and purchasing their lights back first. And again, as I mentioned, National Grid will be having a tariff that um, would allow you to retrofit what remaining on there. Um, while well, well, they would continue to own them, and we'll hopefully know more about that and we'll get anything out um, once once we do. Um, other question here. Uh, someone had a great suggestion to they asked, do we have any press releases for communities um, program? I think it's a great thing that we will develop, like a standard press release you could use as a starting point. Um, and then they asked about an FAQ or sort of how you involve the, the community. I, I think that different cities and have involved their community in the decision-making process to very, very varying degrees. Um, you know, that is to can draw it out a little bit longer, but it can also lead to a, a great um, final product. Uh, Crow, if you want to mention anything else about the public engagement process you had, I know you, you definitely talked about the pilots. Were there any community meetings or notices that went out? Uh, um, let's see. Um, I mean, it, it, it was brought before city council. Uh, Northampton also has a number of different committees, um, both a parking and transportation committee and an energy and sustainability committee, um, or commissions, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> uh, there was, a, yes, there were community members provided feedback uh, through a number of different public meetings. Um, uh, the one is that we, we really have a, a cohort in Northampton that is concerned about um, the lights in general. General. Um, I'm not sure if they'll ever be happy. Uh, uh, I think there's a, the majority of people are happy, but um, uh, but small cohort is, and they've been very, very vocal. Um, and the communities, you know, our opinion all along has been it's there. It, I don't live in Northampton. Um, uh, they here, and um, we're very open to taking into their their comments um, and trying to adjust things uh, in the direction. That um, they would like to go um, without impacting the costs or the risk that the city is taking. Um, 
um, yeah, one one thing is they they want to put heavy shielding on a lot of lights, and the city is um, has refused to do that because lighting experts say that it's a, not a good idea. <laughs> so. Um, um, uh, but it's a small cohort. Um, but in general, Patrick, we were just very open. Um, I've received many phone calls from folks too. We've spoke just, you know, we were very open to having the community respond to us. Great, and Tom, anything you want to add on that community engagement piece? I think uh, we've covered pretty much all I can think of for the moment at least. All right, great. We have in here on what is the best way to recycle the retrofitted fixtures. Uh, generally in our programs we've had, the, it's been a requirement that the installer uh, recycle them and provide like the certificates that they, that they did recycle them and they get to keep the salvage value as a, as a benefit so it doesn't really cost anything for them to handle some of the potentially hazardous materials that might be in the ballast of the existing lights. So um, I don't have a, a better question about that, right, or a better answer on that, but uh, they do get recycled as a matter of, of course. I had a few questions about, you know, about designers or auditors. Who, who can I use? Who can, um, you know, how, who, who use? Who's out there? Uh, there are a number of, of vendors in the marketplace, a uh, lot of great experienced vendors at this point, given the work that's been happening in Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, and other states around streetlight retrofits. So we, um, what, what we're going to do is, through the program, um, from MAPC at least, the procurement and the install, sort of a requirement, we need to work on that collectively. For the audit design and the project management, we are um, also open to uh, helping you procure those and can, first off, we can recommend people who will have worked with communities in Massachusetts, and then we can also do a, um, a collective procurement on that front. You, you could certainly go out on your own, but if you're interested, we think we could, um, you know, get something done and in place fairly quickly. So there's there's definitely an abundance of, of qualified folks out there. And we'll be sending a copy of the presentation out along with a link to the recording. Some of preventative maintenance. Uh, Chris and Tom maybe could just talk to how you are handling maintenance and if there's anything on the prevent side that's happening, but just an overview would be good, would be nice. Uh, the system is newly installed in our case in Westwood and you have a 10 year warranty on everything. And again, with the, with the vision system, if you see a light out, we have a contractor who, on a per light basis, will come down to remove and replace. We keep approximately a, a half dozen codes in, in reserve so that, that if our light is out, we send somebody out, they replace the cobra head. We have a fixed number for that, and they can put the old one back here. In fact, I have one on my desk that we send back to Cree for replacement. So we have replacement lights in stock, and we have a really short have 10 good years, and uh, quality, uh, these LEDs should go a lot longer than 10 years. Do you have any specific preventive maintenance program that we're doing at the moment? Um, and, um, uh, in Northampton, um, uh, as part of the Siemens contract, they have um, a one-year, they're going to basically be, be um, uh, um, maintaining the lights for one year. Uh, now that that didn't include if a you know a pole gets knocked down or if the utility needs to replace a pole um, and the lamp arm needs to be uh, moved onto the new pole. Um, we're actually working with a change order uh, with our with uh, Siemens that they would then um, have those use as well on a per basis. So there wouldn't there wouldn't be a um, you know a dollar per pole a dollar per lamp charge. It would just be on a uh, per issue basis. And um, since this goes for one year, we are looking forward to this because it's going to give us a lot of experience with how much activity is out there um, uh, so that we can be better informed when we go out to uh, contract for ongoing maintenance. I happen to know that in Greenfield, who's already placed their LEDs, that they just have someone on call that pays on a, on a lamp, one lamp, you know, a one-off basis uh, for any lamp that they need to be 
um, then be repaired. And lastly, I'll say, as part of our selection of which streetlights we chose, the Leo Tech, um, you know, of course, it was on, it was on cost and, and other things, but one of the things we did look at um, uh, was warranty. Uh, people said no one's seen these, they haven't been installed for 20 years. So the best we could do was to look very closely at the warranty and um, uh, LEDs, warranty based on a certain percentage of the LED lights going out. Um, uh, so one manufacturer we knocked out because they wanted a higher percentage of the little LED lights to go out before lamp was considered failed. Um, uh, that didn't seem to make sense to us. Um, uh, so that's part of what we did was we looked at warranty and I expect the lights to work really well. Thanks. Great, appreciate that. Um, so we've got about five minutes left here. I've got a, a few questions, which I think I'm just going to handle, and then I would say uh, folks can continue to shoot me questions and um, uh, you know follow up after this. Uh, the folks who have reached out to me already, um, I know some of you are like ready for the MOU. We will uh, be getting that over to you very shortly. I'll also you know be sending out this presentation, uh, the link to that online form where you can sort of get the first, um, you, you can start the process of, of, of reserving your grant funds. So uh, a few questions. A uh, question on the procurement of fixtures. Someone asked, are we going to be, for each collective procurement, are we going to be choosing one loot or one installer? Um, I think for the for the fixture procurements, what we'll look to do is get, um, we not require, I think right now, we're not going to require that one fixture is chosen by the group, but what we'll do is probably structure it uh, in a way that um, I think some of the MLP towns did where that they'll pricing um, individually and then if we get um, community to work together and choose the same one, we'll look to see discounts there. So you'd, be, you'd essentially preserve your choice, but there would be a, um, a special benefit to to uh, working together as well. Uh, again, even the base prices, we expect to see uh, better pricing through the collective procurement. Um, so the poll, uh, the cost per poll or per streetlight for the audit, those I think on the high end uh, might be around $15 per light, but uh, I think we've seen um, that go down and we expect that to go down, but might be on the high end, $15 per light. Uh, someone else asked about ordering days. Uh, we're going to, there's usually at least a two-month delay between when you select and place the order for your fixtures and when they when they're delivered. Streetlight manufacturers just don't carry a lot of inventory, and there's a lot of demand nationwide for this. So there's basically like a two-month delay probably built in. Sometimes uh, there can be even a little bit more of a delay, but that's that's kind of the way the industry works. Um, and someone else asked about uh, additional resources on blue light. I'll try to put together some of the ones that I have to send around and, um, and provide. I, I really think what Chris did was interesting on that with the help of, of Siemens. Um, I had to jump in on that real quick, real quickly. Um, one thing that will come out is the American Medical Association put out a, a uh, what do you call it? A, that, wanted, um, and that is, um, you, if you read it really, if you just read it, it sounds very, very alarming. I mean, about light. If you read it carefully and look at what they actually say, um, you know, with Northampton, the lights we put in follows everything that they um, uh, suggest that we do. Uh, so, um, you know, so according to uh, them, we would have put in exact. We, we, we did it exactly right to avoid any kind of problem. But if you read the AMA paper, it is incredibly alarming. Um, and um, it's one of the reasons why we have commu some community members up in arms. Um, so uh, take a look at it with a very um, specific way when you look at that AMA paper. Um, just look, look for what is the criteria they are trying to, to base this on. I like Chris. I think that that's really helpful. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, the cell phones and computer screens that we're in front of for probably, you know, 8, 12 hours a day are, are sources of blue light. So it's also putting that in, in comparison for, for folks. Um, and uh, finally, it looks like someone just asked me about whether installation labor was included in some of the costs I, I quoted earlier. So I think that, that as I mentioned, conservative, like $400 per light, that uh, did include the installation costs. 
And, uh, you know, as Tom mentioned, he got some quotes as low as like 55 or 60, um, rain up, you know, to around 100. So we're hoping to keep that on the lend um, uh, there. Uh, so I think with with that, oh, we also have a question about some APC assist the municipalities with the acquisition of their streetlight systems. So uh, if you're interested in pursuing that, please get in touch with me. We, you know, through this grant that's technically not part of the scope, um, this grant targeted at municipalities that own their lights and helping them get from owning lights to retrofit. But we as many communities get retrofitted as possible. Let's let's follow up on, on that if you're interested and see you know we can how we can assist. It's um it's a fairly simple process as Kevin from Eversource is mentioning to to request the purchase price. And uh, it takes a little while to get that back, but we can definitely help, especially in those those early stages um, of that. So I would just ask any of my panelists, anything you're burning to say before we uh, say goodbye to everyone? All right. Well, I want to thank everyone on the phone and our panelists. Um, I look forward to being in touch with everyone. I will send out contact information, the presentation, all this stuff, uh, probably tomorrow, um, possibly Monday. And we look forward to, to getting, getting moving. Have a great day.